Hey everybody, today we're talking about maybe the very, very first signs of dementia. When I was trained, we were taught that depression was a risk factor for dementia. But what if that's actually not true? What if it's actually the earliest, in fact, the very first sign of brain disease? Not sadness, not grief, but six specific symptoms were recently reported to be the very first thing that people see specifically in Alzheimer's disease, even decades before somebody has memory symptoms. And this came out of the University College of London, where they tracked over 6,000 older adults for 22 years to see how their relationship between depressive symptoms and dementia symptoms ultimately linked up together. So this is not speculation. This comes from long-term longitudinal population study published in the Lancet Commission on Dementia Prevention. So if you are in midlife or somebody who cares about somebody in their 50s, this is the research that's gonna give you insight into some of those early changes. And why it matters so much is because the new FDA approved disease modifying drugs for Alzheimer's disease have to be administered as early as possible because what they do is they get into the brain and they're able to break down and get rid of the amyloid buildup. And over time, decades of time, when the amyloid builds up outside the cells, inside the cells, it suffocates them and they can't get micronutrients, oxygen, all the things that keep neurons alive. And over time, we see the death of neurons. Over more time, we see the death of networks of neurons. And that's when we have things like word finding difficulties, memory issues, trouble remembering people's faces. So these researchers followed these 6,000 older adults for about 22.6 years and 10% of them went on to develop dementia. So what they did is they actually drilled down on those folks and the ones that met criteria for depression in midlife had a 27% higher risk of developing dementia. But here's where it gets really interesting. We're so glad that they didn't just stop at that and say, oh, it's depression and that's a risk factor, blah, blah, blah. They did a great job of doing a item analysis of actually breaking down, well, what are these symptoms that people checked off yes to that would put them in the category of having depression? And what they really found is it really wasn't the diagnosis of depression, it was six specific symptoms. So the first one was losing confidence in myself. The second one was not able to face up to problems. The third one was feeling emotionally disconnected from others. The fourth one was being chronically tense or strung up. The fifth one was difficulty concentrating. And the final one was perfectionism combined with dissatisfaction. Oh boy, so having these symptom clusters together, <clears throat> excuse me, increase the risk of dementia by 30 to 50%, oh my God. And it was the strongest in people who were age 52 when they said yes to that cluster of symptoms. So in other words, when these symptoms appear in midlife, they have to be early signals of brain vulnerability, not mental health distress because over time, they were very strongly linked to the likelihood that somebody developed dementia. And we've known for a long time that this amyloid in Alzheimer's takes decades and decades, but the missing link in the literature has been, well, how does that express itself? What is the clinical functional relevance of amyloid as it's building? We used to think that you had to have two, three, maybe even four decades of buildup, and then it, the networks would get so weak and damage that you would kind of tip over into memory problems, word finding difficulties, but that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be the case that even early, early, earlier than anything cognitive, we're actually seeing kind of a mood or a behavior change. So here is the hopeful part, because you know we're always gonna try to find that. This makes a growing body of literature make a lot more sense. So here's what we really know, midlife, is the most powerful window of time for you to reduce your future risk of dementia. So what is actually the, the mechanism of action here? Like why are those symptoms in the end the risk factors for dementia? Well, there's kind of two theories. One is that these symptoms lead to uh, chronic stress 
that emotion. So it can, can kind of go two ways, right? So it's like the symptoms caused the brain to be more vulnerable and have a harder time working. So they were more likely to have amyloid buildup. Or the other theory is this is actually an expression of the amyloid buildup. So let's go for the first one first. So if you're chronically stressed, you know, don't feel, you feel like you have to do everything perfect, but you're not still satisfied. You're basically lonely. Uh, you know, go through all those six symptoms, the chances are you're going to be pretty overwhelmed, right? And when we're overwhelmed, we have a loss of psychological flexibility, which basically means we get kind of rigid and we can't really go that extra mile to think outside the box. We kind of lose our ability to think on our feet. And that can quietly interfere with self-care. And I really think it's a two-way relationship. I think it's people who have a genetic predisposition to build up amyloid, but then this might be the modifiable risk factor in real life. This might be the nature part of it. The amyloid is the nurture part. And over time, this kind of amplifies the brain vulnerability. That's how I'm thinking about it and erodes brain resilience over time, especially in midlife, because what we know about midlife is this is when cognitive reserve is at its most flexible, where you can either add to it by doing things that require your brain to learn at increasing levels of difficulty and complexity, or this is when your cognitive reserve can deplete. If you don't <clears throat> challenge your brain enough, if you're lonely, if you don't do things that are cognitively stimulating, if you don't have enough novelty in life, if your sleep is poor. So we've always kind of known that, okay, midlife, you know, you, you kind of either like the use it or lose it philosophy is the most important. So with these six symptoms, I think the idea is you would kind of lose the ability to go that little bit of an extra mile to do the self-care to make sure your sleep is prioritized, that you're moving enough, that you're not needing cheap processed food to be comforted, that you actually have a deeper level of well-being. So definitely sleep is involved here because that is when we clear out metabolic waste, including amyloid and tau buildup. And we know that chronic sleep deprivation in midlife does lead to accelerated neurodegenerative processes. So even if you are going to get dementia anyway, because of genetic issues, if you have poor sleep, especially in midlife, it's almost like you pay the piper in your 70s and your 80s when you're potentially going to develop dementia. Of course, physical movement is everything uh, to the biological system of the human body. It supports blood flow circulation, helps reduce insulin sensitivity, which is really important. Uh, helps us with stress regulation, neurogenesis. I mean, really moving your body every day is a very, very highly evidence-based way to reduce your risk of brain change. Then, of course, nutrition. What do we choose to put inside our mouth, right? That's another, it's going to either add to the reserve or it's going to deplete the reserve. So that affects our mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cells and how they work. Uh, can contribute to neuroinflammation, which over time is definitely a risk factor for developing dementia. And one of the big things we know is underfueling, so just kind of ignoring the fact that you need to have a balance of really good micronutrients every day from whole foods, or erratic eating. Those two things we know really do strain brain metabolism. And all of these compound over the decades of midlife, lowering the brain's ability to tolerate later insults. And when you feel that way, those six symptoms, I think the truth is that you avoid things that are overwhelming because you're already up to here. So chronic avoidance in and of itself is associated with prolonged stress activation, which can damage over time hippocampal and prefrontal lobe circuits in the brain. So this is really important. So midlife, I want you to think about it like it's either going to be a time of protection or increased vulnerability. The other thing that I think can happen when you have some of those six symptoms is you reduce your follow-up with medical care. You're way more likely to not go to the dentist and have your teeth cleaned. You're way more likely to not wear your CPAP machine. You're way more likely to not get or wear your hearing aids. You're way more likely to be erratic with taking your blood pressure medication, not checking your glucose if you have diabetes. All of these conditions are very influential on the future health of your brain. So. They result in vascular, metabolic, and inflammatory burden. And when you have those three things going wrong, 
those are major drivers of later in life cognitive impairment. So why does this matter for our brain? Well, guess what? If you were younger and you're listening to me in your 50s and your 60s, you really got to get to work. We all need to be thinking of our future selves. And even though this research does suggest that there's this very clear open window, I also want to give hope to you if you're in your 70s, 80s, 90s, or over 100, because the research is also clear that even though it's probably the most bang for your buck in midlife, it's really never too late to start. So even when someone is diagnosed with dementia, it doesn't mean that we should stop trying to reduce modifiable risk factors that are making the dementia go faster, accelerate quicker. The decline is happening more rapidly. That's one of the biggest things that I see in brain healthcare now is like, okay, we've got the diagnosis of dementia. Well, okay, we're not really gonna care too much anymore about you know, blood pressure, blood sugar, mood, those kind of things. So it's really never too late to begin to try to have a healthier brain. So making small, compassionate changes for ourselves in the new year, better sleep, gentle movement, social connection, finding purpose and meaning, and challenging our brain with higher and higher level of difficulty is really what science tells us works now. So let me know in the comments what you're planning to do differently in 2026, and let's motivate each other. Take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.